As I was building a separate video on my opinions on dairy products, I decided that including a section on IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, would make the video too long. So here is a video dedicated to IGF-1 and dairy products, largely as it pertains to cancer. But here's the twist. From here on out, this content is taken word for word from my book I wrote back in 2010. In my research, the best resource for this chapter is Robert Cohen's book, Milk the Deadly Poison. This section reviews his book with added updates and commentary. Should you like to know more about this topic, as well as the scope of corruption and greed between Monsanto and our federal government, I suggest you read it. The scientific community for many years had known that isolated bovine growth hormone injected into another cow would increase milk yield. It does this through a variety of effects on the mammary glands in the udder mediated by insulin-like growth factors since the mammary tissue of cows does not contain binding sites for bovine growth hormone, BGH. However, extracting the BGH was not economically feasible until biotech companies came up with the economies of scale processes through recombinant technology. In the spring of 1994, the FDA approved the use of a genetically engineered hormone called recombinant bovine growth hormone, RBGH. That little R comes when a naturally occurring hormone in one species is recombined with the genetic material from another species. In this case, Monsanto merged the genetic material from the bacteria E. coli with the naturally occurring bovine growth hormone to yield a marketable product that would increase milk production in cows, which it does. Sounds yummy, and I'm sure it's good for us. Monsanto says so. And of course, the FDA's assumption that RBGH is safe for humans is based upon short-term rat experiments done by Monsanto-sponsored scientists. Other independent investigators question the Monsanto data. Not relenting to pressure, Japan, the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada all banned the use of RBGH because of concerns over the health and welfare of cows as well as humans. In fact, in 1998, reviews by Health Canada determined the use of RBGH increases the risk of mastitis by 25%, affects reproductive functions, increases the risk of clinical lameness by 50%, and shortens the lives of cows. Monsanto then lobbied the Canadian government for approval. Dr. Margaret Hayden and Health Canada researchers reported to the Canadian Senate that officials from Monsanto had offered between $1 to $2 million to Health Canada scientists. Offers, she said, could only be understood as an attempted bribe. Of course, Monsanto and Eli Lilly, which paid $300 million for the drug in 2008, want their product to succeed. Monsanto spent about a half a billion dollars developing the product called Posilac. They are also intertwined with the FDA. Why else would the FDA force dairies that opt not to treat their cows with RBGH to state on their labels that, quote, no significant difference has been shown between milk from treated and untreated cows? What use could possibly come of this policy other than to serve financial interests? Unfortunately, state politicians aren't much better than those at the federal level. Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana have had less than desirable results supporting the RBGH free labels. In 2003, Monsanto asked the state of Maine to stop issuing an official quality seal, which the state only grants to dairies that do not use the RBGH. Maine refused. Later that year, Monsanto sued Oakhurst Dairy. Maine's largest dairy operation over its RBGH free labels. Ultimately, Oakhurst changed its labels, adding the statement, quote, FDA states no significant difference from cows treated with artificial growth hormone. The states can't seem to get their act together, but some businesses that survive off of customer decisions are in the lead. In 2007, Kroger and Safeway banned the use of RBGH treated milk in their store-branded milk products. In January 2008, Starbucks stopped using RBGH-treated milk, 
and in March of 2008, Walmart banned RBGH use and their store brand milk products. I recommend you check with your town to see if RBGH is using the milk supply at the school. Or you can pack a lunch like I do and avoid the fiasco altogether. If this hormone is such a good thing according to those with money and power, then why do numerous dairy farmers report extensive problems with it? And many other proudly advertise that their product is RBGH free or at least attempt to do so. What is it that other nations, farmers, and consumer action groups know that you don't? What is so wrong with RBGH? Even Monsanto states in its package insert that the drug increases the risk for mastitis. Mastitis is an infection of the udder, which produces a white blood cell response, better known as pus. This infection is an indication of the health of the animal and requires antibiotics to resolve. The journal Nature reported that Posilac increases somatic cells, pus, in milk by a whopping 19%. Researchers estimate that an ordinary glass of milk contains between one and seven drops of pus. You get to drink pus, antibiotics, and more. Beyond the issues RBGH causes to cows, there is no valid concern that RBGH will be passed down to the human consumer. RBGH is not directly the issue. RBGH causes cows to increase their production of a growth factor, in particular insulin-like growth factor 1. As humans, we have no receptors that can effectively recognize this RBGH protein, so it cannot do to us what it can do to a cow. IGF-1 is another story. An amazing coincidence of nature, both the bovine IGF-1 and human IGF-1 are identical. Pasteurization does not adequately destroy the IGF-1 protein. The acidic environment of our stomach does not either, since the calcium in milk decreases acidity. This is similar to the logic of drinking milk when you have an active ulcer, since there is temporary relief in the acid effect. In essence, the buffering capacity of milk, the casein, and even homogenization are all incriminated in allowing these proteins to escape degradation and move downstream into your intestines for absorption. There are those who would argue that IGF-1 is destroyed during pasteurization and digestion, but studies have disproved this. Dr. Samuel Epstein is a professor of environmental and occupational medicine at the University of Illinois School of Public Health and chairman of the Cancer Prevention Coalition. He has published some 260 peer-reviewed articles and authored or co-authored 11 books. He has stated that RBGH injections cause substantial and sustained increase in IGF-1 levels in milk. He further states, IGF-1 is not destroyed by pasteurization, survives digestion, and produces potent growth-promoting effects. In fact, it is against the law to sell milk from a cow in the beginning stages of lactation due to the increase in hormones present. Why would the government impose this law if they thought that these orally ingested hormones had no impact? Even if the milk you drink is not tainted with RBGH, it still contains levels of IGF-1 you want to avoid. Consider the Japanese study references earlier or the following data. Monsanto conducted a survey of 100 bulk tank milk samples to ascertain the naturally occurring range of IGF-1 in untreated milk. These samples would have been drawn from millions of pounds of milk in total, collected from numerous cows at various points in time, providing a reasonable number for what you might expect in the milk you'd buy. They found that the average concentration was 4.32 milligrams per milliliter. Robert Cohen was kind enough to run some calculations for us to shed some light on what these numbers mean to the average American. When looking at milk not treated with RBGH, the amount of IGF-1 in a 12-ounce glass of milk is roughly equivalent to the amount of free, unbound, naturally occurring IGF-1 in an adult human. In other words, one glass of milk doubles the amount of IGF-1 floating around your body looking for a receptor. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below.
the ranges seen for increases in IGF-1 in RBGH-treated cows vary significantly depending on who is referenced. We'll go with one Cohen references, which is on the low end of quotes, at an average increase of 78%. So, if you drink a glass of RBGH-treated milk, that's another 78% above the doubling of free IGF-1 you're already receiving from untreated milk. If you're an adult, what if you're a child? You're familiar with human growth hormone therapy. It's touted as an anti-aging remedy, and it's quite pricey as well. I won't be elaborating on the pros and cons of HGH, but I will say that the effects of HGH are mediated by insulin-like growth factors. There are several types of insulin-like growth factors, but IGF-1 is the most potent. In fact, it's the most powerful growth hormone in the human body. As we've stated, IGF-1 from bovines is exactly the same molecule as in humans, containing the identical 70 amino acids in the same sequence in both species. It is the BGH-induced increase in IGF-1 that has its effects on the mammary glands of the cow. So, if it's identical in humans and can be absorbed into our bloodstream intact, then don't you think it can have an impact on human breast tissue. IGF-1 receptors surely aren't limited to breast tissue. They are ubiquitous in the human body. IGF-1 on its own does not cause cancer. Cancer, as we best understand it, is the unregulated growth of tissue resulting from some insult. IGF-1 is a growth promoter. It doesn't care which tissue holds its receptor. It will plug into the receptor and initiate its cascade of growth results. Simplistically, this is seemingly all well and good if you're a competitive athlete and have no aberrant cells. However, if you have some cells replicating as they should not, then it's a bad thing. IGF-1 has been implicated in the growth promotion of numerous cancers. The scientific community has come to learn over recent years that many of us have cancers just not in the way that we picture them. According to the National Cancer Institute, more than half of all American men have some cancer in their prostate gland by the age of 80, yet only 3% will die from the disease. Most do not progress to the point of endangerment. In 1994, an article written in the New York Times referenced data showing that although 1% of women between the ages of 40 and 50 are diagnosed with breast cancer, autopsy studies within that same age group show that 39% of these women had a breast cancer. Our bodies seemingly keep in check the progression of these aberrant cells in most cases. Do you want to feed these cells with fertilizer and chance losing that control? Pancreatic, colorectal, central nervous system, lymphomas, and other cancers have much evidence to support the IGF-1 connection. Let's take a look at some quotes from researchers. In a research article published in 2001, researchers looked at IGF-1 status and tamoxifen. As you may know, tamoxifen is the most commonly used agent in the treatment of hormone-responsive breast cancer. In addition to its action on estrogen receptors, the drug also acts on IGF-1 in a positive manner mostly by increasing the binding proteins that eat up the free hormone. This researcher states in a pathology journal that, quote, insulin like growth factor 1 is a potent mitogen growth motor for breast cancer cell lines. Increased concentrations of IGF-1 have been found in patients with breast cancer compared with healthy controls. It is now accepted that high concentrations of IGF-1 are a risk factor for premenopausal breast cancer. This rationale is probably partly based on the findings from the Harvard Nurses Health Study, where in 1998, it was published that, quote, premenopausal women with high IGF-1 levels in their blood had almost five times the risk of developing breast cancer than those with low IGF concentrations. It is also of interest to note that the authors state, quote, Healthy subjects with high IGF-1 concentrations, when controlled for binding proteins, have been shown to have an increased risk for breast cancer. In other words, 
when you consider the free or unbound IGF-1 in the blood as opposed to the IGF-1 that is bound up by proteins, the risk increases. It is the unbound IGF-1 or any other hormone that is able to carry out its mission. This refers back to Robert Cohen's calculation earlier on doubling the free IGF-1 from a glass of milk in an adult. In a review on IGF-1 and how it may promote cancer published in 2003, the author states, quote, multiple large case control studies in the past five years have reported positive associations between high circulating levels of the insulin-like growth factor 1 and risk for different types of cancer. Finally, circulating IGF-1 may facilitate cancer development, though it likely does not cause cancer to form. In another review on IGF-1 and cancer from 2003, the authors state, quote, the IGF-1 receptor is commonly, though not always, overexpressed in many cancers, and many recent studies have identified new signaling pathways emanating from the IGF-1 receptor that affect cancer cell proliferation adhesion, migration, and cell death, functions that are critical for cancer cell survival and metastases. An in vitro study from 1994 in ovarian cancer suggested that their data, quote, support a role for IGF-1 in the proliferation of ovarian cancer and suggest that IGF-1 and estradiol interact in regulating this malignancy. Remember that milk contains estradiol as well. In a 2008 trial looking at IGF-1 and its binding protein on colorectal cancer, results mimic others previously stated. The researchers measured the plasma levels of IGF-1 binding protein and other parameters in 527 patients participating in a randomized trial of first-line chemotherapy for metastatic colorectal cancer. They found that higher binding proteins were associated with a significant better chemotherapy response rate. Remember, it is the binding proteins that tie up the free IGF-1, preventing it from freely promoting cancer growth to a large degree. Our next example comes from Canada. Testicular cancer is the most common cancer among Canadian men aged 20 to 45. The researchers analyzed data from 601 cases of testicular cancer and 744 healthy controls between 1994 and 97 for dietary correlations. The results suggested that a high dairy product intake, in particular a high intake of cheese, was associated with an elevated risk. Depending on the cheese, it can take up to 10 pounds of milk to make one pound. All of these hormones, pesticides, and IGF-1 have been concentrated into a smaller source for your ingestion. The connection to cheese here is not unique. There are many other researchers who link high IGF-1 in cheese to cancer. A review article that commented on several cancers had an interesting point for your consideration. They stated that epidemiological studies consistently show a positive association with high consumption of milk, dairy products, and meats. They went on to state that these factors tend to decrease the active form of vitamin D in the body, which at low levels may enhance prostate carcinogenesis. Said another way, the more active vitamin D you have in your body, the more likely you are not to get cancer. More support for vitamin D. So that concludes my direct quotes from my book many years ago, but with themes which are clearly still relevant. I hope you've come to understand the connection between milk, whether treated with RBGH or not, IGF-1, and the prospect of cancer promotion. If you haven't seen my other new video on dairy products entitled No More Dairy Proteins, IBS, Autoimmune, A1 vs. A2, Lactose Intolerance, and more, I suggest you check it out. It's relevant for many more people than IGF-1 is for cancer. If you combine these two videos, you'll understand why I strongly recommend against the consumption of dairy products during my consultations and in many protocols. If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols. And here, you can watch the next video.